Good afternoon, everybody. If you're joining from around the world, good morning and good evening. Welcome to our last Science From Your Sofa session for 2021. I'm Amy Leitman, president of NTM Info and Research. I will be your host for today's session. Very pleased to welcome you today. Today's topic, waterborne pathogens, microbiology, and mycobacteria. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Joe Falkenham, from Virginia Tech and Dr. Ted Maris from Toronto Western Hospital. Dr. Falkenham is in the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech, where he runs the Falkenham Lab, which focuses on the understanding of epidemiology, ecology, physiology, and genetics of waterborne opportunistic pathogens, including mycobacteria, pseudomonas, acinetobacter, stenotrochomonas, and fig... Sphingomonas. Okay, Joe, you're going to have to tell me afterwards how to pronounce that one. Significantly, isolates of these species recovered from infected patients and their plumbing share the same DNA fingerprints, and Joe has been a leader in discovering this and publishing on this. Studies in the Falkenham lab have identified shared physiologic features that are determinants of the ecology and transmission to humans, including surface hydrophobicity, attachment to surfaces, biofilm formation, concentration in aerosols, resistance to disinfectants, growth in protozoa and amoeba, and ability to grow on low concentrations of organic matter and at low oxygen levels. Starting in October 2015, the Falkenham Lab has been developing protocols to reduce the numbers of M chimera and operating room instruments called heater coolers that have been shown to be the source of these M chimera infections in patients. Other current lab studies involve developing protocols to infect to disinfect hospital plumbing systems colon, colonized by these disinfectant resistant bacteria, studying the effects of water heating, water flow, and stagnation in plumbing systems on this group of pathogens, understanding the role of biofilms in the development of antibiotic resistance, and describing the mechanism of exclusion of M. avium from plumbing by members of the genus Methylobacterium. In 2003, Dr. Falkenham received the Gardner Middlebrook Award for his contributions to mycobacteriology. In 2015, Dr. Falkenham was elected fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health. Dr. Maris is the director of the Toronto Western Hospital Non-Tuberculous Mycobacterial Disease Program and a consultant respiratory in respirology at UHN, a staff physician at the TWH TB Clinic and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto in Canada. He received his MD at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, clinical training in internal medicine and respirology at University of Toronto, and a master in science in clinical epidemiology at University of Toronto. He took advanced training in mycobacterial diseases at University of California, San Francisco, and took electives at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado, and Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. His clinical research focus is in the field of non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. He has published extensively in this area. He's co-author of the new multi-society NTM guidelines with ATS, IDSA, ERS, and European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease, all weighing in on those guidelines as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We are pleased to have you here today. A few housekeeping items for our attendees. So today we have a long, long list of questions that you submitted in advance. Um, I do have them in the queue. I will be reading them out during the Q&A portion for our, our presenters to answer. Some of them will be answered during the course of the presentations, in which case we will skip over those questions. If you did not have a chance to put questions into the queue ahead of time by sending them in, you can also drop them in by finding that little Q&A icon on your Zoom. You type your question into the Q&A box, you hit send, and the questions will be entered into the queue. We have a lot of people attending this today, and we have a lot of questions. We're going to do our best to get to all of them. Whatever questions we don't get to, we will get them put into NTM Connect for our presenters to answer over the coming weeks. Don't forget about our upcoming presentations. Our last two wellness webinars of the year are coming up next weekend, Saturday, December 4th. Improving Your Well-Being with Effective Communication and Social Support with Dr. Devin Smith from National Jewish. And on Sunday, December 5th, Dietary Supplements with Michelle McDonald, also from National Jewish. So registration is open for those webinars now. Don't forget to sign up. 
We'd like to thank INSMED for their ongoing generous support of all of our programs through this year. We could not do what we were doing without the support of INSMED and others like them, and also the generous support of all of our donors. We thank you very much. We're very excited that we've been able to offer all this program this year. We hope you've enjoyed and appreciated it. And we're very excited that we'll be bringing more programming to you next year. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also all of our, our webinars are archived on our YouTube channel, on NTMIR YouTube channel. And you can also learn more about us and sign up for the latest news and information at ntminfo.org. Dr. Maris, you are first up on deck. Please take it away. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Amy. Um, I really am thrilled to be here today. And I am particularly pleased because of the topic and because Dr. Falkenham is here to take us through this topic and I expect to learn as much as anyone else. And I look forward to hearing from him in the uh, latter part of the presentation. My job in the first 15 minutes or so, after I share with you my disclosures, my job is to talk about the importance of the environment and why I think this is an important topic and to help us uh, frame the subsequent questions that will be discussed by Dr. Falkenham. Uh, whenever a, to have a title like the importance of the environment now with climate change front and center in our consciousness, I just wanted to put this up. This is a different aspect of the environment than we're hearing about in the media and experiencing in our own uh, climate um, regions. Um, but I think both are very, very important. Getting back to the topic of the day, thinking about the importance of the environment, I've divided it into four areas, the host, the pathogen, short-term outcomes and long-term success. And I'd like to think about the individual as the individual contribution of each of these four to help us understand why the environment is so important for NTM lung disease. First, I'd like to think about <clears throat> risk factors at the host or individual level. Now, NTM exposures are, as we know, extremely widespread, perhaps ubiquitous. Perhaps everyone is exposed to them in a, in a variable or substantial to a substantial extent, but only a small proportion of us is susceptible to this disease. So at the population level, we think about host risk factors being most important and the environment being less important. That's when we're thinking about the entire population. So what sort of risk factors are we thinking about? Well, uh, most of them, the host risk factors, most of them, unfortunately, are not easily modifiable. Increased age, female sex, underlying structural lung disease like emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, et cetera, uh, physical body type, and the use of medications or immune suppressive medications often for autoimmune diseases. Now, most of these are not easily modifiable. And you'll note that the asterisk tells us that a number of these are associated with bronchiectasis and thus the nodular bronchiectatic form of NTM disease. Uh, I'd like to diverge a little bit into the uh, these two main types of NTM lung disease to think about chest imaging and think about types of disease that we see, the so-called nodular bronchiectasis type um, is seen with mid-lung bronchiectasis. This is a coronal um, reconstruction of a CT scan. The right middle lobe here is full of bronchiectasis, essentially destroyed with bronchiectasis, all these cystic changes. And the lingula, the left mid zone here on the 
left side of the heart also similarly affected. This is a female predominant uh, disease. 85% or 90% of people who have nodular bronchiectatic NTM are women. Uh, there are nodules, as we see here, posteriorly in the right lung, um, but there can be cavities as well. The other type, somewhat less common, is fibrocavitary disease. Usually, this is disease seen in the upper lungs, where there is cavitation or holes in the lungs and the associated thickening or densities around it. We see on the CT scan on our right side, this patient has emphysema. It's actually visible on the CT scan as these uh, areas that are a little blacker, where there is less lung tissue damage from cigarette smoking, and this large hole in the top of the right lung and surrounding thickening, um, which is the, the classic appearance of fibrocavitary disease. The, usually it's focal in one area or sometimes a couple of areas, usually seen in people with emphysema. Next, I want to think about the pathogen. Uh, it's widely dispersed as we know, and, and Dr. Falkenham is gonna tell us about this and exposure to it is nearly ubiquitous. Where do we get infected? What is the source of the pathogen? Waters, you can see Dr. Falkenham's research appears um, quite pro prominently on my slide. All types of natural waters, fresh, brown swamp, acid, brackish water, seawater, and water in the engineered or built environment. Our distribution systems, our plumbing systems, our plumbing fixtures, where these organisms can survive with very few nutrients, forming biofilms to protect themselves and reproduce within them. And they can certainly tolerate disinfectants to a much higher concentration than most of the other nasties that our, dis that our purification plants can kill off quite easily. They're also more heat tolerant. Uh, and in soils, many types of soils, residential, commercial, et cetera, they can attach to the soil particles, they survive with few nutrients, and their growth may be stimulated by certain uh, chemical co components of the soils. So there have been a number of studies trying to identify the specific NTM species and actual strain in, a pa in patients' environments. There has been at least one study where soil isolates were sought among patients who had MAC lung disease. There have been a number of studies where household plumbing and water was sampled to look for the actual strain that was infecting the patients. And I'd like to just summarize this slide to say that generally non-tuberculous mycobacteria were very frequently found in the homes or environments of these patients and in a minority, but I think an important minority, the same strain was identified from the patient's environment as the strain from the sputum, really be, being very strongly suggestive that these environmental sources are the source of the disease. There was an interesting study published two years ago in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society, looking at the home water and soil sources of 56 patients who had MAC lung disease and 51 population controls. People who didn't have MAC lung disease, but they were matched by age, by sex, and by geography. The investigators sampled water from the bathroom and kitchen faucets, shower aerosols, were um, sampled with an aerosol sampler and indoor and outdoor soils were sampled. They looked at the isolation rates of NTM and specifically MAC in the environments of people with MAC lung disease and also in the environments of the control individuals. When they looked at NTM, so any non-tuberculous mycobacterial species, Looking, focusing on the shower aerosols, NTM were found in the shower aerosols of 46% of cases and only 22% of controls. 
So the odds of finding NTM in the shower aerosols of people who had MAC lung disease was four to one. So really substantially higher, which was also statistically significant from a scientific jargon point of view. What about MAC itself? Well, MAC was found more commonly in the shower aerosols of cases, 25.6% versus 13% of controls. Now the odds ratio was three to one, although that was not statistically significant, clearly it was much more common suggesting that if these investigators had a larger sample size, they probably would have shown that it was in fact statistically significant, suggesting again that the environment is potentially an important source. So now I want us to think about the environment at the individual patient level. So not the population level. The population level, I think it's all about the host. At the individual patient level, once we know someone has bronchiectasis or previous NTM, and the environment is key because the susceptibility is there, this is where we need to consider possible interventions. Why do we need to consider these interventions? I think the following two sections spell it out very clearly, looking at our short-term outcomes in the treatment of MAC lung disease and our longer-term success rates. So treatment, as I think many of the uh, listeners know, viewers know, it's very challenging. It's challenging because the bugs are inherently resistant to most of our available antimicrobials. The drugs are difficult to tolerate in many cases, and we need to, patients need to take multiple antibiotics. Combining multiple antibiotics for long periods of time means a lot of adverse effects. Pushing through this difficult treatment, one would hope for a really nice outcome, and many patients do achieve a really nice outcome. But if we look overall at a meta-analysis of clinical, of clinical studies published before 2017, only 60% of patients had cure, meaning a year of culture negative sputum. If we look at two studies from expert centers, one in Seoul, South Korea, the Samsung Medical Center, and one at University of Texas, Tyler, these two ex, uh, centers of excellence, their experience treating people who have non-cavitary macrolide susceptible MAC that has never before been treated, never before treated, so treatment naive patients, their outcomes were 71 to 86 percent success. So even the best of the best clinicians treating the relatively milder disease, these are the outcomes described. So clearly we need to do better and this is one of the reasons why we need to think about other interventions, including environmental interventions. Thinking a little more about short-term outcomes, this study also came from the Samsung Medical Center. They looked at 49 of their patients who had persistently positive sputum despite a full year of guidelines-based therapy, multi-drug antibiotic therapy for MAC lung disease. They, they looked at the strains of MAC that patients continue to isolate in their sputum. And they found that only a quarter, this, only a quarter of patients had the same strain each and every time. 50% of people with persistent positive sputum were found to have a new strain in their sputum over time. Maybe these patients had multiple strains from the outset and it was never detected, maybe they are acquiring new strains from the environment. It was clear that a quarter of patients had mixed old strains from their initial positive sputum, diagnostic sputum, and new strains that hadn't previously been detected. And as an aside, over half the patients had identifiable so-called polyclonal infections. So they had more than one strain 
and their diagnostic sputum specimens from before treatment was initiated. So this really messy picture of multiple strains, new strains on treatment, makes me think that the environment must be really important. Recurrence on treatment, thinking about um, short-term outcomes a little more, is also a problem. Many patients who convert their, many patients convert their sputum, and some of those folks will revert their sputum to positive again. So this one study, first authored by Richard Wallace from UT Tyler, they reported that 14% of patients who had initially converted their sputum went on to have microbiological recurrence, at least two positive sputa while still on therapy. So they converted to negative and then they reverted to positive persistently so. And using pulsed field gel electrophoresis typing, they decided that there was a new infection <clears throat> with a different strain in 18 of, the, 18 of the 23 patients for whom they could do genotyping. So almost 80% of patients seem to have a new strain when they reverted to positive. Kind of analogous to the data from Seoul, making us think again about the potential impact of the environment and whether there can be acquisition of new strains even while on treatment. And finally, long-term outcomes and the challenges in this area. Microbiological recurrence after completion of treatment is a substantial problem. Now, this is not disease recurrence. This is a recurrence of positive sputum. Disease recurrence will occur in a subset of these individuals. But recurrently positive sputum is seen at 30% in 14 months at this study, in this study from Seoul, and 48% at four years in the study from Tyler. And in patients with nodular bronchiectasis, it is overwhelmingly reinfection with a new strain of MAC. Again, our understanding suggests that this is more issues with the environment and environmental sources. This is a graph that draws a picture looking at recurrence, microbiological recurrence in patients who have nodular bronchiectasis, the blue curve versus the fibrocavitary form, the red curve. And you can see in the blue curve, the recurrence rate is substantially higher. So in summary, I'd like to say that at the patient level, environmental sources, I think, are very important and need to be considered. But at the same time, we need to consider them in a rational and calm approach, recognizing that complete avoidance is impossible and focusing on the areas that are likely to be higher yield and trying our best to avoid becoming too wrapped up in avoiding everything in our environment and losing, uh, losing control and losing our ability to still, still enjoy life. So where do we go from here? Of course, we go to Dr. Falkenham and I will stop sharing my screen and um, I look forward to the discussion uh, and the, uh, the review of all the questions you sent in. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. I want to thank you not only for your good words and the background and your way of helping us over the difficult and uh, confusing issue of recurrence. I think that's a very important one. It's actually one that's currently being investigated by a group at the UVA at the University of, Me of Virginia Medical School right up the road. And we hope we get some answers one of these days. Now, my approach, ladies and gentlemen, is to go through this as kind of a problem and response, and then to add a critical com 
uh, critical comment, which is support for the response or the remaining questions. So both Ted and I have ended up with remaining questions and uh, that certainly is the case. So let me begin at the source, so to speak, uh, municipal piped water in the United States. Municipal piped water in the United States has non-tuberculous mycobacteria, a wide variety, depending upon where you sample and what sample you collect, they can be very high numbers, not so, not so very high numbers. And next to that response is a link to a journal article. In this particular case, that journal article is from Applied Environmental Microbiology. It's a report of a study that I performed in collaboration with Mark Le Chevalier and Cheryl Norton of the American Water Works Company. They manage, I think, a thousand water systems in the United States, across the United States. They, um, they also are great collaborators on research projects. And uh, that's how Mark and I got hooked up. And we found that throughout the United States, municipal systems had mycobacteria. The one difference was that if you had well water, you had a well and your house got well water, you had less and fewer and maybe even absent, you didn't have mycobacteria at all. I'll circle back to that because I'm gonna tell you about spring water having the least number of mycobacteria. So, uh, that's really started with our observation that people with wells didn't have many mycobacteria in the water. Now, why do we have municipal water, piped water with mycobacteria? Well, one of my students, Rob Taylor, looked at chlorine and other disinfectants and their effect on mycobacteria and the bottom line is that mycobacteria are very resistant to chlorine, chloramine, chlorine dioxide, and ozone, which are commonly used disinfectants across the United States. Now, the resistance is not twofold, it's not tenfold, it's about a thousandfold more resistant. That simply means that at the standard concentration of chlorine or chloramine that are used in water treatment systems, it'll take a much longer period of time to inactivate the mycobacteria. They will be around happily carrying on, doing whatever they wanna do, uh, in spite of the fact that you have chlorine, which if given in a high enough concentration and for a long enough time, we'll kill them. But the concentrations we use are based upon water management levels. You can't hold water in the presence of high concentration of chlorine for a long enough period of time without taking up a third of the United States as being really big water lakes. Another reason the mycobacteria are present in drinking water is that they adhere to surfaces. For our purposes, pipe surfaces. They attach, they start growing, they excrete, excrete some material which we call the matrix that they reside in. And so it's a sticky surface layer on pipes. The mycobacteria rapidly adhere. Just recently, as Amy mentioned, we've been looking at an instrument called a heater cooler that is used in cardiovascular surgery. When you stop the heart, you have to take over the circulation and you pump the blood 
through a heart-lung machine, basically one that exchanges CO2 for oxygen and vice versa, but you have to keep the blood warm. And so you use a little heater cooler. It's a relatively small box. It's like a small undercounter refrigerator or a dormitory refrigerator that I just got my granddaughter, who's now a freshman at Virginia Tech. That little instrument was tested at the factory by using water. The factory's in Munich, Germany, and unfortunately the water in Munich, Germany has a particular strain and species of mycobacterium, mycobacterium chimera, and essentially all of the heater coolers were inoculated with that. Now they emptied it after testing and shipped it, <clears throat> but as we have just recently found out, the mycobacteria can persist in biofilms in a dry state for a very long period of time. We have about 40% survival after uh, seven weeks. So uh, these are hardy little bacteria that have learned to survive in the environment. The test that has affected the mycobacteria is persistent. And they build up a very thick outer membrane. This is rich in lipids and actually contains probably about 30% of the entire cell weight. Now, this makes them impermeable. Since it's made of lipid, they're hydrophobic. They hate water. In fact, if I suck a bunch of mycobacterial cells on top of a piece of filter paper and I put a drop of water on it, the water beads just like a waxed car. Why do the NTM rapidly adhere to surfaces? Because they hate water. Water's got charges. Hydrophobic cells don't like charges, so they move to any surface, which can be a hard surface or it can be a soft surface like an air bubble. The air bubble will carry the, mycoba the mycobacteria to the surface. When the bubble bursts, you get not only a droplet of water ejected into the air, which is a way of aerosolization, but you also end up with a surface micro layer, very thin layer, that's rich in mycobacteria. It's also rich in organic materials and other things as well. <clears throat> because the mycobacteria make these, and they turn out to be very long chain lipids, our lipids friends have about 18 carbons in them. And these are the lipids in our cells. Mycobacterial lipids are between 60 and 80 individual carbons in length and each, when you add a carbon to a lipid molecule, you used up one ATP, the energy coin of cells. So mycobacterial cells divert a lot of energy into making the outer membrane, but that allows them to persist in lots of environments because they're resistant anything chemical that would kill them, and they don't get washed out. So that goes on not even not only in streams, but also in pipes, and more than likely, I think it occurs in our lungs. They're very difficult to get rid of. Now, what are the NTM sources in residence? One of the things that my colleague Richard Wallace and another colleague, Leah Landy, who's in Philadelphia looking after a group of patients outside of Philadelphia in Wynwood, Pennsylvania, is the water heater. The water heater warms the water up and the organisms can grow faster. When we did a survey of homes, not only did we discover that if you had a well source, you had few mycobacteria, but we also discovered that if your 
water heater was set to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which for you Celsius people is 55 degrees, you didn't have mycobacteria. By contrast, if you turned your water heater down to 125 degrees, because the Department of Energy of the United States told you to reduce energy usage, you would have lots and lots of mycobacteria. I am not a fan of green buildings. Green buildings have lower water heater temperatures, which means more mycobacteria. It also means more Legionella and others. Another, and Dr. Maris pointed out this very valuable study from Jerry Cangelosi's laboratory showing that shower aerosols, mycobacteria in showers, were closely, were a risk factor for mycobacterial disease. Now, in a survey of shower heads across the United States, and it was a huge survey, it was carried out by Norman Pace at the University of Colorado and his students, 70% of shower heads in the United States had mycobacteria. That's not a trivial number. So shower heads turn out to be a big focus of my laboratory, not only to figure out why the mycobacteria are there, but also how we can do things with them. For example, you have a shower head. Unscrew the shower head, clean it with detergent. And after you've cleaned it with detergent, submerge it in Clorox or a chlorine-based bleach. The two steps are necessary. Cleaning with detergent does two things. It breaks the hydrophobic bonds. That's why we clean with detergents because many stains, many even grass stains and others are adhering to our clothes because of hydrophobic bonds. The same is true in my dishwasher. Cleaning also makes the mycobacterial cells more permeable because it sort of melts apart this thick outer membrane. So you do both of those, the cleaning to make the cells more susceptible. You also can release them from the surfaces and then the chlorine to disinfect or kill them off. Now, it took me a while to get around to my, my head around this third point, tap and basin drain aerosols. We've not tested whether Mycobacterial infection can be traced to the mycobacteria in drains, but there's a lot of other data, and that's why I use the word likely in terms of NTM, that NTM in the drains, and they certainly are there, can be aerosolized. Many of us have a tap in which the water flows directly into the drain that generates an aerosol. Uh, that was illustrated to me one morning when I was getting ready to shave and I turned on the water tap and the sun was shining directly at a right angle to the flow of the water. And I saw all these little bubbles popping up in the air. But Drains have been shown to be a source of Pseudomonas, infect, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, Stenotrophomonas maltophila, just to pronounce that fun little mycobacterium, Acinetobacter baumannii, all have been traced to drains. So I think that the mycobacteria are members of that club. Refrigerator water and ice. I think many of us here in the United States and Canada have a tap on the front of our refrigerator. 
before this evening is out, friends, take a piece of paper or cardboard and tape it over that tap and the dispenser for ice cubes. They are horrible things, quite frankly. How I discovered this through a patient's son. This is a patient who was in Clearwater, Florida. Her son called me up when we were proceeding with an NTM sponsored study of, of NTM mycobacteria in households. And he asked if we would sample his mother's house. We needed recruits. We're always delighted to have recruits in studies. And he went down, sampled mom and dad's house, sent us the filled bottles and the, the biofilm samples. And one day, my technician, my technician, Myra Williams, who is the empress of finding mycobacteria, not just the queen, but the empress, she has a great eye. She brought into my office right here a plate. On the plate was Mycobacterium abscessus, one of the waterborne Mycobacteria. And I looked at it and it had about 10,000 colonies of Mycobacterium abscessus. We don't normally see that, friends. She had spread a tenth of a milliliter. So that meant there were 100,000 Mycobacterium abscessus per milliliter. And a milliliter is a cubic centimeter, a small little bit of water. I immediately called the son, who now is in my pantheon of good relatives of NTM patients, told him the story. He then related, he then told me that his mother drank eight six ounce glasses of water a day, which was a doctor recommended. Well, that turns out that she was drinking about a billion mycobacteria per day. His next question was, do you want me to send the refrigeration apparatus to you? Well, I'm not an engineer, but I have an engineer son and they do take things apart. We got two boxes from Federal Express and sure enough, that water system, which consists of a pipe leading into a large tank. The tank is about a foot and a half by a foot. So it's a giant pill filled with water and then it goes to a cooling apparatus. Now, it's not inside the cooled part of the refrigerator, but outside. And so it's bathed in all the hot air that comes from reducing the temperature in the refrigerator. It was loaded with mycobacteria. So when you get a chance, make sure you don't use the refrigerator water and ice machine. Next. A question, flushing toilets. I recently traveled south and back north to go away with my wife's family for Thanksgiving. Well, you go to an airport and you go through a bathroom and if you have to stop, you realize that you're being bathed in an aerosol. So I had added this actually before I got on the plane, but now I'm kind of underlining it here does toilet flushing result in the generation of aerosols? I'm quite sure it does. Do they have mycobacteria? I don't know, but we'll test that. Is drinking water a source of mycobacteria? Certainly in the case if you have gastric reflux. Rachel Toms in Queensland, Australia, has shown that very clearly, a group of Japanese mycobacteriologists as well. Now, again, with regards to water, and I'll probably say this three or four times because on the list of questions that have been prepared, uh, there are lots of questions about water. 
tap water has mycobacteria. Well water seldom has mycobacteria, low numbers. Distilled water does have mycobacteria. We tested grocery store purchasable distilled water. The reason is, although during the distillation process, the water is boiled, when you get condensation, it goes into bottles and jars and things like that that could already have mycobacteria. There's something called purified water. I don't know what that is, friends. I think it's the processed water that comes from the soda bubbly beverage manufacturers, but it has mycobacteria. The one that popped out and is compatible with our discovery that well water had few mycobacteria is spring water. Spring water has few mycobacteria in part because it's filtered through the ground. Some spring water may be filtered. We'll talk about filtration later on. Some may not be, but spring water generally is my fallback position when somebody says, I'm gonna go traveling. I'm gonna get on a cruise ship. Well, take, about, take some spring water. You'll probably be able to buy spring water on a cruise ship. Now, what about dealing with non-tuberculous mycobacterian water? Raise the hot water heater temperature to 130, 55 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, sorry about that. That's important. That works. <clears throat> with 10 of our patients in outside of Philadelphia, they were kind enough to allow us to do an experiment. The experiment was, let's raise your hot water heater temperature and see what happens. Within eight to 12 weeks, we never, I, we could not isolate mycobacterium avium anymore. And we're good at isolating mycobacterium avium. So where we got this, I mean, this was really way down. So we're really pleased with that. That's a recommendation which has actually been tested. What about flush unused tap showers and toilets? We had a graduate student, very bright guy who's now, uh, because he's so bright, has got a job uh, running a water system in uh, basically North Central Virginia. Very successful, very bright, bright guy. And he went to the Philadelphia homes and asked the residents to identify two sites. One was a bathroom that was frequent, that was most frequently used, and one was a bathroom that was least frequently used. And once he knew those, he sampled water. Well, we found fewer mycobacteria in the flushed and actively being used and very high numbers in the unused, unflushed bathrooms. Now, this Philadelphia area turns out to be an ideal place for doing that study because it is in the main line, what used to be called the main line of Philadelphia. These are big houses, two and three story, four, five, six bedroom, bathrooms all over the place. Mom and dad raised, a whole bunch of kids, nobody's living in most of the bedrooms and bathrooms anymore. They've grown up, gone on. In many cases, it's just mom and dad or just mom or dad alone. So we have a group of collaborating master's degree students in public health in Wynwood at the Land Canal Medical Research Institute under the direction of Leah Landy, our colleague, and they go and they flush in these houses because we don't want to have the patients flushing and running a shower because they would be doing the same thing as Dr. Cangelosi and his car colleagues shown that you're running right into a risk factor. 
something that was pointed out to me some years ago. Now, I am not, I'm kind of tall, I'm 6'1". I'm not slender. I don't have a BM body mass index of 20. My, my, my fit tells me it's not that, but I'm not going to divulge that right now. So I'm, I'm kind of iron protected against the mycobacteria, but I'll tell you, people at risk should stay out of areas where they're flushing. Now the mycobacteria grow at low oxygen concentrations. So stagnant water, which is what our student sampled, doesn't stop them from growing. They're perfectly happy growing at low oxygen concentrations. Another way of getting rid of mycobacteria is filtration. The key here is not the manufacturer, but rather the pore size. The pore size has to be 0.2 micrometers or less. I've tested some of the ma manufacturer's filters, in particular the ones made by Pal Medical, and they do not pass mycobacteria. And the filter manufacturers now have become aware of NTM patients. And so what they do now is they're now showing us or maybe even having Joe sample and test their filters to show that they don't pass. Boiling kills microorganisms. 10 minutes of boiling. If you live at a high elevation, then you do the same calculation you do for cooking and baking and things like that. Not five minutes. There's a citation there to a paper by uh, uh, Kevin Winthrop out in Oregon, uh, you can look at that and get an assurance that boiling works. I talked about spring water, I talked about uh, well water, I talked about sterile, purified, I don't know what those words mean necessarily. And, and my survey of grocery store water is limited. Ultraviolet light kills NTM. It's not something, the ultraviolet radiation of water is not something that's widely practiced. It's only practiced particularly in aquaria where you have big expensive fish floating around. You can't just dump in some chlorine when things look turbid, you have to UV irradiate. There are instruments that UV irradiate. Mycobacteria, although they're resistant to chemical disinfection, are just as sensitive to UV as our other bacteria. So if a machine says it kills 99.9% .9 of E. coli, it ought to kill 99.9% .9 of the mycobacteria as well. Of course, you can disinfect your own home. That's a big deal, friends. I am not a fan of whole house filtration or how whole house disinfection or UV irradiation. First of all, because you've already got mycobacteria in the biofilm of your home. And all you'd be doing is killing maybe the new ones that have come in, but the ones are growing on the wall, popping off and populating the water. How are, we, how are we infected via aerosolized mycobacteria? So a shower head filter will prevent the NTM from passing. Also, you can clean and disinfect the filter. That'll work. Good, thank you for scrolling up. You can clean and disinfect the shower head. Shower head mists, mists, M I S T S. If you turn on your shower, hot and cold water, and you don't even have to be in there, but you let the shower run for as long as you would normally be in the shower, that of course is age dependent. My grandchildren can take showers which last up to 45 minutes. 
I've been claimed by my wife of taking a long shower, which is about five or a little longer. She's one of these in or out. But if you go into that bathroom after the shower's been operating and there's a mist, that mist is enriched for mycobacteria. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what can you do? One thing you can do is get a, an exhaust fan that actually works. My wife is a builder and developer of homes and communities. And she takes me to the National Home Builders Association meeting, which is held almost every year in Las Vegas, because they have conference spaces that are the size of football stadiums. It's wonderful. <clears throat> I learn about financing. I learn about nailing. I do not win the nailing contests that they have there. But I do go and assault almost the people who make bathroom fans. And I go with a small roll of toilet paper and I put it over the fan and I show them that the fan does not suck air to hold it a piece of toilet paper. I'm getting angry now because you need a fan that really sucks the air out. And I don't know if any are available. I'm very disappointed. You can also get a shower head with big holes. Big holes mean that you get drops rather than mist. That's better because the large, the, because the drops you can't inhale into the alveoli, the drops fall out of the air very quickly. Early on in this, I discovered Floridians had taken their shower heads off and were simply bathing in the stream. Not a bad idea. Now, a really good source <coughs> of aerosols, excuse me, are humidifiers. There's a type that I actually accidentally bought to study aerosols of mycobacteria. I went to my local Target store and there was a humidifier, probably the first one in line. And it was described as an ultrasonic humidifier. It generates an aerosol with millions of mycobacteria. I can fill up a bathroom sized room, which is just a little ways down the hall with 100,000 mycobacteria per cubic meter of air in about 20 minutes with that baby. The mist coming out of the two ports in it are like a San Francisco fog rolling across the bay towards my alma mater of Berkeley. You can't see a thing. Normally when I speak, if I'm speaking live to a group, we go to one of the home builders, do it yourself places, large mega warehouse like places. And we stop off at the hammer area in the lumber and uh, tools area. And then we go and systematically smash every humidifier. Why? because I know many of you use humidifiers. Now, is there a alternative? Yes. The humidifier that's described as evaporative. Nowadays, the evaporative humidifiers have a, a, an absorbent paper or some kind of material that sucks up water and a fan blows through that filter. Those potentially can generate a mycobacterial aerosol, but the airflow has to be high enough to knock the mycobacteria off the filter. So for these little home units, it's not a problem. But in a, an, an evaporative humidifiers, I say only evaporative humidifiers, don't get an ultrasonic one. 
Another thing that I don't recommend like are spas, hot tubs, or indoor pools. All of them have mycobacteria in the water. If you have a little gastric reflux, well, you're gonna get some in your lungs. Spas and hot tubs generate potent aerosols. Cecile Rose out at National Jewish Hospital identified and characterized mycobacteria, the causative agent of what she called lifeguard lung. Lifeguards at swimming pools in the winter in Colorado, those pools are closed. They're not outdoor pools. And the lifeguards, now these are not older, slender, taller women. They're not people with cystic fibrosis. These are young, healthy kids who look good in bathing suits. They were getting something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis to the presence of mycobacteria. I know swimming is good exercise. We have found a correlation between swimming and mycobacterial disease in HIV patients. These are patients with reduced resistance to mycobacterial disease. So I would be careful. Vinegar as a disinfectant. Vinegar does have a low pH, it's around two to three. It's acetic acid, but mycobacteria are acid tolerance. Our colleague, Louise Bermudez, studied mycobacteria in stomach acid. They survived. Now there are, there is a paper and I have it linked there on NTM susceptibility to vinegar. And the problem, and you should never show a paper to a scientist because we rip it apart and put it in little teeny mini shreds. They chose the wrong species. They chose the wrong dose. I don't think they did the right growth. Sure, they showed that some were sensitive. One of the strains they used is Mycobacterium smegmatis, which is basically a lab rat strain. I don't trust any of the results from that. They also used Mycobacterium tuberculosis, a really serious disease. Number one, two, or three, depending upon who you talk to in the world. Now, that's an obligate human pathogen. It doesn't survive in the environment. Only aerosols between people over relatively short distances. So that's not like our little Mycobacterium avium or intracellulary or Mycobacterium abscesses that's hardened by really the environment. Now, water and breathing, that's my first step, friends in starting to think about nebulizers. I don't know anything about nebulizers. I don't, I've never touched one. Luckily this afternoon, one of my undergraduate students came by and he's an asthmatic and he knows all about nebulizers. So I'm gonna sick him on nebulizers because he knows how they work and how they operate. And we can look at places where they can get contaminated with mycobacteria and ways of disinfecting it without destroying the machine. That's always my problem. And I can think of ways to disinfect something, but I also inactivate it totally. You can disinfect nebulizers, I think, with chemicals, with steam, with heat, but we haven't tested things. Alcohol, ethanol. So, somewhat like the, the hand stuff that we use nowadays. Mycobacteria look upon that as another thing to grow on. They are not susceptible because the ethanol reacts with the lipids and is inactivated. Peroxide, hydrogen peroxide. 
No, that doesn't work because the mycobacteria have a very potent group of enzymes that break down catalase and form bubbles. So we avoid those. Filters. Filter is an awkward word. Now I'm on uh, what number of my filters? Number one are filtration. Filtration means you're passing some mixed liquid population or solid through a grid and only things smaller than the grid can will get through. So filtration doesn't mean that you're gonna remove bacteria. <clears throat> For example, the 0.2 micrometer di pore diameter filters that we talk about as medical filters and that get rid of mycobacteria don't filter out back don't filter out viruses. Viruses are much smaller. Granular active charcoal or activated charcoal filters, GAC filters. Long ago, and that's the citation there with the DOI number. People at EPA tested granular activated charcoal filters and found that mycobacteria grew in them. Now they don't pass through immediately because the path, si the path size is large enough for mycobacteria to go through, but because you've taken charcoal and burned it and crunched it into a mass, the pores, which are really fractures and things like that, are not a straight line, so it takes a longer time to get through. GAC filters are wonderful in removing the taste of disinfectants, metals, organic compounds from water. That's wonderful. But don't think they remove mycobacteria. In fact, the mycobacteria grow. So you can put a GAC filter on, and then after the GAC filter. Down here, you have a 0.2 micrometer filter to get rid of the mycobacteria. The problem is, is that yes, you change the GAC filter, but that change is based on running out of chlorine binding, not running out of mycobacterial sources. Garden soil. With Marianne de Groot, who was a fellow in infectious diseases at NTM, we showed that NTM from garden soil from some patients infected with mycobacteria was identical to the ones in the lung and in the soil. Now, my wife is an avid gardener. She doesn't have the risk factors for NTM disease, <coughs> nor do I, coughing. But when we work with potting soil, we get it wet. That's all we do. That way we don't make dust. You can garden with an N95 mask and wet the soil. Purchased potting soil, as Marianne and I showed, huge numbers of mycobacteria. They love potting soil. They love estuaries. <clears throat> they love coastal swamps. The Chesapeake and Delaware Bays are like little culture facilities for mycobacteria. Huge numbers. Mycobacteria are tolerant of salt concentrations up to about two and a half percent. They grow at two and a half percent, two percent, one percent in fresh water. They don't grow in three percent. There was a question on this long list of questions about, I like to go to the beach. Go to the beach, friends. Mycobacteria are not in aerosols from ocean water. They're not in the ocean water. So I've come to the bottom of my little list here. And I will turn things over to Amy and you can organize things from here on, even though I probably took way too much time and I apologize. That's quite all right. We left plenty of time for you to answer questions. 
Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll start with the uh, document that we have where we have a, a number of questions being asked. Um, so, um, and we'll just, we'll just go through them and, and you can, if, if one of them was addressed, you can just sort of remind everybody what your answer was. And then there are some that are more detailed and you can get a little more into that. Um, we have patients asking about what type of water to drink, bottled, you know, filtered, Brita, et cetera. Um, you know, that's a big concern for patients because of, uh, you know, reflux issues. Yes. Uh, number one, spring water is first on my list of purchasable water. Don't buy and drink purified water, sterilized water, or no, no, you shouldn't say sterilized, distilled water, purified water. If you, if you're the very last, if you have to boil water, boil water. The alternatives nowadays we have, and we've tested a couple of representatives of this category. These are bottles. Everybody carries a bottle of water with them now. Some of the students here at the university they carry gallon jugs of water. I don't know how they can get through the day. First of all, just carrying it around. The, but we've tested a bottle called the Life Straw bottle. It has a 0.2 micrometer filter in it. You fill it up with just ordinary tap water. <clears throat> and when you drink, you're sucking it through that 0.2 micro filter. And we didn't find any mycobacteria. Now, when we test these things, friends, what we do is we add mycobacterial cells to the water. We don't just take any old water and say, okay, we'll see if we don't have any. We challenge these with the stiffest challenge possible. So we put a billion mycobacteria in the bottle and it filtered them out. Jen Honda, who's at uh, National Jewish, Jen did the same with two different <coughs> UV-based bottles. And they too killed 99 point, they killed 99.9%. So there are alternatives, particularly for traveling or even for home use. You can use the water from a life straw to boil the vegetables. You can use it for drinking at home. They can use it for making coffee. So that's the water that I would suggest and avoid granular activated charcoal filtration only And the only time you can use that GAC filtered water is after it's been filtered through a 0.2 micro filter, micron filter. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions about the boiling water thing. Um, can you explain the, the science and, the, and the, the sort of the research behind boiling for 10 minutes and then um, another, mi another minute for every thousand feet above sea level? Can you address that? Well, the link that I have right there goes in. Okay, perfect. We we will, by the way, be posting all of those links for all of the papers. Yep. <laughs> so there, okay, Joe's holding a paper, paper right there from a from a good friend and a very bright young NPM physician, Kevin Winthrop. And I will just read here from the abstract: log ten logarithmic scale. Reductions in colony forming units at 10 minutes were 7.1. So that means that if you had a billion cells, <coughs> you likely killed all but 100. You can increase it with 15 minutes, but boiling has been the standard for sterilization for eons and eons. And in order to get boiling to be effective at high, con at high elevations, you have to boil longer. And that's kind of a standard, it's more of a recipe dependent thing that I, le I learned it through recipes rather than from uh, microbiology. Okay. 
All right, let's take a look. Let's stroll down the list. Okay, so we have a lot of questions about sterilizing equipment, um, airway clearance equipment, nebulizers, et cetera. So I'll start reading this and you can go through it. Uh, many of us use aerobica and air case. Aerobica instructions indicate to air dry after use, wash it in soapy water at the end of the day after the last treatment. Once a week, douse it with alcohol or boil it for five minutes. Um, should you be, the, they're asking the question, should we be boiling everything we use for 10 minutes regardless, or should they be bringing the water to a boil, boiling it, and then I guess, you know, putting it in the boiling water. Um, and then, you know, same thing with like the instructions for the nebulizer they're using for their medications is the 10, 10 minute rule in effect here too. And how do you apply it? Do you boil the water first and then put the equipment into the boiled water, into the boiling water? Um, can you use distilled water for boiling the components? I guess if you're boiling the water, it doesn't really matter as long as it's boiled. Um, they're just trying to ferret out the, the best way to, to go about this stuff. So what are your thoughts on that? First, as I said before, I've never tested any nebulizers, an aer aerobic or air case. Uh, and I'm trying to get together people I just told you about my undergraduate student who is very bright, who knows about these things and will try to mount if we find money and collaborators and things like that to actually test these. First thing that I would do is follow the manufacturer's directions and, un and I'm likely to be using Escherichia coli, the lab rat for everything having to do with water. Okay. There, what I'll do is just confirm what I think, and that is that they actually have tested an organism and they get and they kill three logs, which means they kill 99.9% .9 of the cells from a sample. But I don't know what they sampled. So we can, we can easily contaminate a brand new fresh nebulizer with mycobacteria, <coughs> excuse me, find out where the mycobacteria are in the instrument and then see how we can disinfect it. So this is on my list of things to do. There's also been a suggestion, and I think it's in this list as well, as using a baby bottle sterilizer. Well, we'll get a baby bottle sterilizer and find out what it does. I can also take one home. I can take the nebulizer home and put it in my dishwasher and see what happens. Now, some of this may be literally destructive testing, friends, but that's okay. Let's do it now before people go out and use it. Okay. So that's what I'll, that's about all I can say about nebulizer. Okay. And I would assume the same thing goes for, um... Uh, you know, like the baby bottle sterilizers, you haven't tested them and are that's gonna... correct. Okay. Um, same questions regarding tap water. I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what water you're using to to clean the to boil the devices as long as the the water is boiled first. That's right. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about brushing your teeth? What kind of water should they should they be concerned about the water they're using to brush their teeth? I guess is the question. Well, I've talked about this with my dentist who's petrified of me because I keep telling him there are mycobacteria in his dental unit <coughs> and, and he's inoculating me. Um, the, um, with regards to toothbrushing, we don't have any reports of mycobacterial infections other than in children who have erupting teeth and they get cervical lymphadenitis. They get kind of chipmunk cheeks down here. They're, they're lymph nodes right here at the point of the jaw and they get big. And that's from little kids who go outside and eat dirt as I did as a child. And they have teeth coming in and that's a big deal, friends. It hurts. 
you've got damage, you've got blood, you've got other things. These teeth are getting in the way and they have to be forced out. <coughs> so in addition to that, we have two legal cases going on in the United States, which involve dental clinics that specialize in removing baby teeth from children. They do a unique procedure called a pulpotomy. And there, they almost are introducing, inoculating the child's cavity, the hole where that new tooth is gonna come out with a good spray of water and of course you damage the tissue. So it's got basically a straight line from the jaw right down to this lymph node. And there have been two relatively big outbreaks, 20, 15 to 20 children. And they've been traced to the water in the dental unit. That's that innocuous little thing where all the tubes come from. So um, unless, you are brushing your teeth with, with a steel brush, I wouldn't really worry about it. My dentist keeps telling me that I've got gum recession because I brush too energetically, but I just do things energetically, I guess. And so the question is, you know, are you damaging when you brush your teeth? I think not. <coughs> so, I wouldn't worry about toothbrush. Okay. Um, so uh, here's a, a good, so there's been a lot of conversation about shower heads. Um, I know you talked at length about um, shower heads and, and um, the size, uh, you know, the size of the holes in the shower head. Um, so there's been some some discussion about whether vinegar works, whether bleach works. Um, we know that vinegar helps fighting scale buildup on, on, on the fixtures. Um, does it help in cleaning them? Is boil, or do we need to boil these fixtures? Like, what do you, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Amy. The, it would be wonderful if we had two or three, only two or three types of shower heads. Unfortunately, when I go into a plumbing store, I see 7 million different shower heads. So uh, the first thing is large holes, which would make drops rather than mist. The second thing is, can you clean it well? I have seen, I want to get one and test it. <coughs> a shower head that opens. It's a big disc, about this big around as I remember, thin like this, but you can literally flop back the top, exposing the interior. That can be cleaned with a brush and detergent, and then you can further disinfect it by submerging it. Now, again, you have to be careful with the material. If you have one that's made of plastic, it may not tolerate long-term exposure to chlorine. Chlorine ruins a lot of stuff, including stainless steel. So you have to be careful there. Okay. Um, question, um, does freezing kill mycobacteria? So freezing water, for example. Oh, freezing. Mm-hmm, like ice cubes. Freezing. Yes, freezing. Mycobacteria can be frozen. Myra freezes the cultures. We put them in the refrigerator. Two years later, Joe says, I remember you got that, that isolate from that lady who drank her refrigerator water. And I want to include that in a new study. Myra goes to the freezer finds the vial because we save every strain, opens it up, puts a little loop needle in, inoculates the culture, and the next thing I know, we have the culture ready to go. Mycobacteria okay. are very resistant to freezing and thawing. 
All right. Well, that's uh, um, so so exposing the ice cube to a steri pen doesn't do anything. That's right. Okay. Um, and you, I know you're, and I'm just going to confirm this. I know you're testing a, uh, a bottle called Crazy Cap, and you've just started the testing on that, correct? Yes, I. We have two Crazy Caps, and I'm using it to instruct my undergraduate student on how to do microbiology. And uh, Friday, we'll be ready to start um, that testing. And so we'll have results coming out hopefully before Christmas time. And oh, great. Uh, that'll be available. And there are some other bottles like that that have UV lamps. But mm -hmm. uh, that's another one's pretty easy to carry around. The only problem, of course, is that for a UV driven disinfecting, you need some kind of power source to charge up the battery, which then works the UV lamp. Yes. Um, with spring water, you've talked about spring water having a, a lower bacterial load. Um, would sterilizing it with a SteriPen or Crazy Cap reduce that load even more? Yes, certainly would. Okay. Now, remember um, with regards to water and UV, UV actually has to penetrate, has to see all of the organisms. So you want to make sure that the water you're trying to sterilize is clear, has no particulates in it, because those would protect, protect the organism in the water. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a patient who's noting um, that a lot, all of this information out there about water, it's very overwhelming to patients. And it is because they're very concerned with exposure and it, it, it feels like there's so many things they have to be concerned about. If there's one thing patients should remember about water exposure, just like, what's the most important thing they should remember? to avoid NTM exposure or to you know, lower the risk of, ex um, of exposure? There are two answers. One is filtration. Mm -hmm. You can always filter the water. Uh, if you need small amounts, then something like the, like these, uh, the small filter bottles, the Life Strong. And the, and those and the live straw and all the rest of these bottles were not developed for NTM patients, and that's why we've had to test them. They've been developed for for campers and these outside types that are all muscle and shorts that are climbing up rock walls. And oh, I need to have a drink. And you're halfway up a rock wall. You, there's no faucet. There's no this and that. And you may have filled your bottle from stream in which something's died just around the corner up the river and filled it with all kinds of pathogenic things. So what do you do? You sterilize it. Okay. Boiling, um, it, boiling is always good. So it, it, it boils down to two physical things, I think, Amy. One is filtration mm -hmm. and the other is heat. Okay. Um, so I... I guess um, there are some people who are asking about like they have water sources or they're using water sources that there are some like mineral deposits and particulates. Um, if, if can they use like a, a, a filtration system like a, maybe a water pitcher just to filter it before they boil it? Um, to get rid of some of those yes. impurities or minerals? Now, the, the, depending upon your source of water, it may have some particulate matter. Those may be pretty small, but you can get a filter a lot cheaper than the 0.2 micrometer filters that will remove those. That would be a filter with a pore size of between one and five micrometers. Okay. So, so that, that certainly would help in uh, making the, the uh, filtration more effective. Um, and there have been some questions, for example, about um, Paul filters, which um, I know you've investigated in the past, and, and they, they have a, a confirmed size of 0.2 micrometers um, to filter out. And, and they, they say that they're, they're 
their filters do filter out NTM. Um, and somebody's asking about another filter uh, called Aquamedics, and um, you've looked at that as well, haven't you? you uh, you've at least I, read up on it. I, Aquamedics. I have actually tested the PAL filters, and yes, they do prevent the passage of mycobacteria. Okay. I've not tested the Aquamedics filters, but I've spoken to them, what, two or three times, and their filters meet a standard called medical, and they're actually certified. And so those, I'm, I'm assuming, will filter out the mycobacteria as well. And one of the nice things about filtration is that if a filter is described as filtering out myco, uh, e, Escherichia coli, E. coli, mm -hmm. then it'll also fill out, filter out the mycobacteria because they're the same dimension. So you, there your filter is not some kind of characteristic that the mycobacteria distinguish themselves from the other bacteria. Okay. Um, and again, we have a, a bunch of questions about shower heads. Should I just not use one? Should I change it monthly? Um, you know, should I use like a pull down shower head? And I guess I'm, I just want to reiterate what you said earlier. A lot of it does come down to the, the size of the hole in the, the, in the shower felt in the shower head itself. That's a, that's a part of it. Yes. Um, and also being able to detach and clean it occasionally. But if you, um, if you have like a, a detachable shower head that can be cleaned, that's also helpful. Yeah, you know, the, the only, if you have a European style handheld shower, the only sort of problem you have there is that that hose, the flexible hose, will have a biofilm of mycobacteria. So you're just giving more places for the mycobacteria to, to grow. Yeah. But ultimately, it's the shower head that's the deliverer. Mm -hmm. So that shower head can be. Put as I put ours in, I just submerge it in Clorox after I uh, take it out and try to scrub it as much as possible. Ours are not an openable one. It's a kind of sleek, fancy thing that I can't open it and get it out without destroying it irreversibly. So um, one of these days I'm gonna get around and put one in, a cleanable one. Uh, with with great big holes, uh, and and uh, so those are the things to consider in this. Ultimately, you'd be fine if you just unscrew the shower head and let that basically you shower with a hose. Okay, all right. There you go. <laughs> There's the answer, people. Um, I want to address for a minute, there's some questions about steam from certain household chores, um, ironing clothes, washing dishes by hand. Um, it, these are basic things that people do, um, and, and they're expressing some concern over it. What, what, what can you tell patients about things like these? Well, in response to a question about boiling water, Myra and I went into our aerosol room with our aerosol samplers and we boiled water and collected aerosols. We found no mycobacteria, even though we filled the water that was being boiled with billions of, I think we chose three different species, Mycobacterium avium, Mycobacterium intracellularia, and Mycobacterium abscessus. So we collected that mist. No mycobacteria. Okay. So, so, so with regards basic to household this, chores, okay. Yeah. And, okay. and ironing, the same thing. I, I have not collected an aerosol, but I did actually, because we were having a party at our house and I ironed my own shirts. So I was given the responsibility of ironing the linen napkins for the dinner. And yes, indeed, I use steam. And I thought of that question, but I didn't collect an aerosol or easy way to collect an aerosol from a, from a steam iron is to stir in the 
turn the steam iron up on its side like this. So the steam is coming out here, get a Petri dish and hold it up against it for a little while. And uh, the next time I iron my shirts, I will uh, do that. I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna find any mycobacteria. Right, I, it, the question really for patients is what can they do in their daily lives? That's really what they're getting to. What can we do in our daily lives? They're trying to mitigate the risk, but they need to know that there are certain things they do that are not going to be unsafe. So things like washing dishes, things like ironing, they don't have to worry about those things too much, right? That's is right. That, is, don't okay, don't worry about those. Now, All right. with regards to hard water and soft water, there isn't any good data distinguishing hard water and soft water on the basis of mycobacterial populations. Something that we've not looked at in great detail because I grew up in hard water California and now I'm in deliciously soft water Virginia. So we'll, we'll figure that one out, but there's nothing in the geographic distribution studies that says we should be concerned. Okay. The one concern that I have is that in hard water areas, you build up a lot of crusty deposits in the shower heads and everything like that. Now, those you might be able to get rid of with vinegar. So you can right. switch them around. And that's, the, that's one of the reasons for the cleaning because those sort of crustaceous areas would be great areas for mycobacteria to hide and then pop out at an inopportune moment. So okay. the cleaning of the shower head should also, also uh, be aimed at getting rid of any buildup of crusting and things like that. And that's where okay. a water softener certainly would help. A water softener is not going to get rid of mycobacteria, nor necessarily affect their numbers, but you won't have those crusty areas. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's, I think that's very helpful for patients who are concerned about these types of exposures. Um, we have some questions about house plants. Uh, you know, we have a number of, uh, of gardeners people who enjoy gardening, they enjoy having their house plants. Um, you know, I, I don't think they're, they're turning their living rooms into, you know, like a, a forest, but they enjoy seeing their, their plants. They enjoy, some of them have orchids. They like to bring them in and see them rebloom. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think one of the, one of the things that, and I, this comes up in conversation all the time with, you know, in various presentations with, with different people is that, this is, a, uh, a, this is something that our patients really enjoy doing. They enjoy having their plants. They enjoy gardening. We don't want to take away all of that from them, right? We want them to be able to enjoy those things. So I guess the question is, you know, is it a problem for them to have a few house plants? Um, I would say no. Although an early study of HIV infected patients showed a, correla a significant correlation between the presence of house plants and the patients having mycobacterial disease. Oh, yeah, and but for and I think we should distinguish that because uh, the HIV patient issue has come up a few times, but I do think we should distinguish that because we, when it, when we're talking about HIV patients, we're talking about patients who at the I guess if these were early studies, they were not on you know on AZT therapy at the time. They were right. so they were significantly immune compromised. Um, they they were not on therapy to, to treat their HIV. So so their their immune systems were were badly compromised. So it it's a very different situation than what a lot of our patients find themselves in. No, I think that's a good point, Amy. Yes. So um, yeah, I want to make sure our patients know so, that because yeah. because in, in this was, this was Marianne, absolutely a risk, right? And especially in the early '80s, they did see a lot of of NTM in HIV patients, and they actually saw a lot of disseminated NTM in HIV patients. They saw like skin yes. and soft tissue disease, um, and so, and actually they they don't see as much of it now in HIV patients. When they do see it nowadays in HIV patients, it's usually in patients. Uh, with HIV, whose disease is not as well controlled as I understand it. 
Yes, that's true. So, okay, um, good. The, with regards to soil, the, the, it, the contact with soil is going to be through dust. And so we're talking about a gardener who's going to be very much immersed in gardening to the point where they may be potting plants in a small, <coughs> in a small area where a substantial dust population can emerge. So we've taken dust uh, soil samples and dumped them about a yard so that they, they generate some dust and collected the aerosols. That's what we did as part of the study with um, Marianne de Groot from National Jewish. That's our standard way now of isolating mycobacteria from soil samples. We don't take the soil samples and do something with them other than dropping them and collecting the aerosols and collecting the small particles. So it's undeniable that the small dust particles from soil, particularly commercial potting soil, which is a great source of mycobacteria, can be a source. So the simple response is, okay, I'm gonna wear a mask when I garden. Mm -hmm. I'm also gonna wet the soil so that I don't get dust. I may get mud, I may get muddy dirt under my nails, but I can get rid of that. So I think that's the best way to look forward to doing that. And in terms of house plants, I just wanted to add because um, I actually do, um, I propagate succulent plants myself. Um, you can buy decorative stones. They're actually kind of flat decorative stones to put on top of the soil and plants. So it, it sort of forms this cover on the, the topsoil of your plant in the pot. So that's something that people can consider as well as decorative stones for the top of the plant. Um, it, it forms a cover. It, it does help um, you reduce evaporation of the water that you're putting into the plant. And it also, you know, it'll keep the soil trapped in there a little more. So if that's a concern for patients, that's also something they can look at. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a very good idea. I, do I, I actually do that with all my plants specifically because of the soil. Um, and it's, you know, it's great. I don't, I don't find, you know, soil dust anywhere. Um, everything stays pretty tidy and it's, it's, it's a good way to, to help minimize that spread. Um, somebody is asking about drains in sinks, baths, and shower stalls. Um, is, you know, is, is that another potential exposure source or is it like not any different than any other exposure source? Um, yeah, uh, shower drains could be sources if the tap bringing in water to the bathtub part hits right into the, into the um, drain. Uh, I worry less about the shower. Most of the bathtubs that I'm familiar with, the tap doesn't go directly into the drain. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about uh, living in a coastal area. They live on the west coast of Canada. If they're walking on the beach or by the beach during high tide and high waves, um, is it a potential source of NTM exposure? Um, that's I I uh, I kind of alluded to that before, and I and I saw that notice, and it came up when I was with a group of patients in San Francisco, talking about it was a patient group in San Francisco, and the question came up: Joe, we live in the San Francisco Bay, and we get fog. Are we getting mycobacteria from the fog? We haven't counted the number of mycobacteria in fog. They are water particles, but <clears throat> ocean water doesn't have mycobacteria. Now, I do worry, for example, after estuaries, or I said, after uh, big storms, particularly the ones that come into Florida, big storms disrupting the coastal swamps and aerosolizing a bunch of mycobacteria. Well, Mady Mizrahe, who's at the University of Miami, has just published a very interesting paper showing, and I have to go 
I'm going through a stack here. Here it is. I'll send you the link because it's not on my little list. There it is right there. Pulmonary non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease in Florida and association with large scale natural disasters. Yes, I did read that recently. And I, I think that actually talks about something that we've kind of known for a while, right? With hurricanes, especially. Yes. And so I, I do think that you raise a, a good question and one that we have to be a little bit cautious about. In, and, and I'm not telling everybody to leave Florida. Uh, I'm telling them to, uh, during storm time, you may be exposed to many more organisms in the aerosols. The humidity is high. You've disrupted natural ecosystems. So it's not just Mycobacterium avium and Mycobacterium abscessus, but rather also uh, Pseudomonas originosa, Legionella, and others. And uh, we've, uh, mycobacterial research has grown. In some respects, I think it's actually led studies of other pathogens that are opportunistic pathogens whose origin is water, such as Pseudomonas and Legionella and others. And I think we're now looking at geographic distribution and what organisms are where and um, at the beginning of Dr. Maris's uh, presentation, he talked about climate change. There have been a couple of very thoughtful leading articles on climate change and microbiology, <coughs> particularly the incidence of infectious disease. But all that's been able to be done is to ask some questions so that we can formulate research and find out the answers. Okay. Um, so can we talk for a minute about medical and dental procedures? <laughs> that seems to be another thing that's really on the minds of people. And I, I know, I remember when Fern was alive, this was something that uh, she took very seriously as well. You know, a lot of dentists office have those little spray guns, like water spray guns that they use to like clean your mouth and everything. And, um, you know, I actually, I, you know, it's been my experience actually since the start of the pandemic, they're really not using that anymore because they don't want to aerosolize. Surprise, surprise. Um, but, you know, I, patients are concerned about, you know, just having their teeth cleaned and going to the dentist. And again, you know, dent, dental hygiene, dental health is, is actually really, it, it, it's a very important part of overall health. It's, it, you know, dental hygiene issues are linked to, you know, other problems, including infection, including cardiac issues. So that's one of the reasons why they encourage people to take care of their teeth. So we want to make sure our patients are not terrified of their dentist, or if they are, it's because their dentist is mean <laughs> and, and, and not because they're not, not because of the water. Um, so what, are there any practical tips, like uh, maybe just asking for a cup of water that they can just rinse and spit because they're going to have to use water at some point? Um, you know, should they be concerned if it's just a cup of water from their tap? Is, is this kind of exposure? It's like a, a very short one-time exposure. Is this, and they're, they're not swallowing the water. They're, they're, they're rinsing their mouth and they're spitting the water out. Is this something they really need to be concerned about or can they just, you know, go about their dental hygiene? Okay, let's start with a kind of a general overall picture and then work down. Number one, there was one fellow in the United States, Emanuel Walensky, a very esteemed award-winning mycobacteriologist who studied cervical lymphadenitis in children. Cervical lymphadenitis is an infection of the uh, mandible, the two lymph nodes on the point of the jaw. And we find it in children, little children, who play outside and eat dirt. They also are of an age to have erupting teeth. That little sort of crater 
where the baby tooth is loose and the new tooth is pushing its way in, there's a lot of damage there. There can be bleeding. <coughs> and so you have a conduit right to that lymph node there in the jaw. So the body and those little children is doing the right job. It's collecting the mycobacteria. Mycobacteria are very clever and so they don't get killed in the lymph node. They continue to grow and irritate it and it gets big. <coughs> you don't treat those infections with antibiotics, but rather you treat those infections by literally lopping out the lymph node. You don't, there are no problems, subsequent problems are as a result of that. So in terms of risk factors for mycobacterial disease, one is eating dirt and having erupting teeth. Now, <clears throat> then we get to the dentist. This procedure called a pulpotomy removes the baby tooth without damaging the adult tooth that's coming in. That's its sort of advantage now in the practice of dentistry. Unfortunately, there have been two outbreaks associated with dentists practicing that technique on large numbers of children in clinics. One clinic was in Atlanta, one clinic was in, uh, I think either maybe Anaheim or Long Beach, I forget the place out west. And the infections have been traced to water in the dental unit. If you're doing that surgery, it, it follows, although I'm not a dentist, that you use the squirter to squirt out the hole where the baby tooth is being removed and Again, you've got trauma to the tissue. So if you've got mycobacteria in the water that's being sprayed in there, then you're going to have mycobacteria in the lymph nodes. So if you're having some other kind of dental procedure, <coughs> cleaning where there is damage and bleeding sometimes, I think it's a good idea to take in a bottle of spring water. And if the dentist doesn't have a spit tank as they used to, but may not now, bring in a, a, a bottle that you can spit in. Okay. And you can also raise the question as I do with my dentist, has the unit been disinfected? Do you follow the manufacturer's instructions? Now, they may not kill all the mycobacteria, but they may kill a, enough. <coughs> excuse me, I'm not used to talking this long. And um, it keeps them in control. We may see within the next several years papers describing improved ways to disinfect these dental units. But it doesn't hurt to ask your dentist, has he disinfected his dental unit? They use that, they make money off of that, so they ought to keep it clean. Yes, um, if they're just going in for a basic cleaning, um, is it, do you still recommend they do that or can they just go in for their cleaning, rinse and spit and be on their way? I would, I think the, the rinsing with spring water and spitting it out would be sufficient. Okay. All right, um, let's scroll down. We, there are, we're, we're, I just wanted to let people know we are coming up on the five o'clock hour. There's no way we're gonna get to all these questions. We know there's a lot of questions in the Q and A. So we will definitely be putting these, starting to put these questions into NTM Connect so that Joe can start answering them. <laughs> um, we well, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm delighted with this opportunity. Don't, don't get me wrong. I We're see thrilled. <laughs> we have 227 
<coughs> participants and 133 questions. Yeah, 227 are still online right now <laughs> after yeah. after uh, like almost two hours. So yeah, so we're there. Yeah, and it's certainly, want... I mean, it's getting close to cocktail time. I'm... Yeah, so um, so I just wanted to let everybody know, we, we know we know there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. We are copying the questions. We will be putting them into NTM Connect so Joe can go in and answer them. Um, we are gonna start a whole thread separately for Joe. So he can just go in and answer the questions as, as we put them in there. Um, it may take a little while to get to all of them because um, we don't want to overwhelm him at the same time. We also you know, want to be mindful of the fact that um, you know, in, a, in a little less than a month, we're coming up on vacation time. So we want to give him some time off. Um, but we will make sure we, we get everything answered um, bit by bit. Um, somebody um, is asking, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about proximity to bodies of water. Um, the Gulf of Mexico, for example, is considered ocean water, correct? So if you live yes. right on the Gulf of Mexico, you're living your ocean water. Um, if they live closer to like a pond or something, is that something they should be more concerned about? Uh, no. It's swamp waters really that are an estuary? Yeah, it's, it's a kind of swampy waters, but again, you have to get <clears throat> either some kind of aerosolization going on, a big storm, or alternatively, you're floundering and swimming in the water. So, uh, in contact with those bodies of water, I wouldn't worry about it. If you live on the ocean, don't worry about it whatsoever. Okay. Quick question, going back to the gardening masks, because this is something has come, that has come up. Um, is a surgical mask sufficient? Should they wear an N95 mask? If we have like a three ply fabric mask, can we put that on? What, you know, we're basically just trying to prevent like the, the particulate of soil, right? Like the, the yeah. soil particles. So is there, I mean, do we need to have, is, is there a particular kind of filter we should be more concerned, uh, particular kind of mask we should be more concerned with wearing or just we want to make sure we're covering our, our mouth and nose adequately? My guess, and I'll confirm this with my colleague from civil and environmental engineering who's been studying COVID and the role of masks and aerosolization, but with regards to soil particles, they're considerably larger than viruses. They're considerably larger than bacteria. The reason that we want to keep them out of our lungs is that the mycobacteria are attached to these soil particulates. Little, little things that glint in the setting or rising or noontime sun. So <clears throat> any mask that's got maybe one or two layers and it can be a cloth mask, will probably work quite well. Okay, thank you. Um, gosh, there's just, it's hard. <laughs> um, so we have, we have questions about swimming pools. Um, let's talk about swimming pools for a minute, because again, one of the things we're trying to do is, is um, help patients understand what, what risks they can take. Indoor pools, probably not a great idea. Um, but we do have patients who, you know, they, they like to swim. They, you know, they, if, if they have, if there's an outdoor pool that they want to go to, I, I mean, you know, we, should they stop swimming or can they, can they still go and enjoy swimming sometimes? Yeah, that's, that's one of these hard questions, um, like the Department of Energy telling me I've got to turn my water heater temperature down and me telling them, no, you're going to have, we're going to have more infections. Um, there can be a risk of mycobacterial infections if you swim in pools. One of the risks is, are the people operating the pool following the rules and keeping a chlorine residual that'll keep the numbers of any organisms and the mycobacteria down. So it's like asking your dentist, not how did you disinfect, 
your dental unit, but rather, are you infecting your dental unit following the manufacturer's instructions? But you do have to understand that when you swim, you are immersing, you're potentially immersing yourself in a pool filled with mycobacteria. Okay. If they okay. maintain the pool with appropriate levels of chlorine, the chance of that pool having high numbers of mycobacteria is low. Okay. Um, so we are, uh, we are coming up on the five o'clock hour. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna give you one more question. Um, so somebody said, you mentioned climate change. One of the outcomes in the West is an increase in wildfires. Um, are there any studies going on that address levels of NTM in the plumes from the wildfires? Um, no, I don't know of anything other than the fact that NTM disease was first really discovered and characterized uh, in the Veterans Administration population of hard drinking, hard smoking, hard working <coughs> veterans of World War II. As they aged, they got mycobacterial disease. In 1950, the majority of NTM patients were World War II veterans that were smokers or farmers or outside workers. They also drank a lot. There were very few women with NTM disease. NTM disease in the taller, older, and slender women was only described in what, 1987. That was our first group of people. Those people, those men had damaged lungs, physically damaged lungs from all the dust and smoke and things that they inhaled. So for example, a risk factor for NTM disease, I would say right now would be firefighting or living in an area where there are substantial fires. And certainly now having lived in California and seen areas that are burned, there's a lot of ash that's being blown around. And some of that ash is nasty stuff. So that's gonna physically damage the lungs, which may increase susceptibility to NTM disease. That makes sense. Well, that's that's all that I think I have left. I I think we yes, we have we have we still have like 130 questions in the queue. <laughs> Um, so uh, we will we will be starting to post those questions. Joe will notify you as we post them, so you can go in and, and start answering them. We'll we'll try not to put more than like fifteen or twenty a day. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's we'll, okay. I'm a, I'm a guy who lines things up, and if there's a job to be done, I can get the job done. And uh, as I said before, and I'll say again. This is an opportunity for me. First of all, it's an opportunity for me to pay back all the patients who've shared their data and information and strains indirectly to me, and I've benefited, which I think is a strange sort of thing because I'm benefiting from people who are sick. And I, in a way, apologize for that. But at the same time, that's motivated me to try to do things for people. I learned about refrigerator water from the son of an NTM patient. I worried about, I, I learned about, um, oh, I can't think of the machine now, from another patient in New York City who's been a good NTM sponsor and helper. Uh, she had installed this system that was supposed to filter out all bacteria. Well, I found out that the system didn't do that. Oh, it's reverse osmosis. Ah. It gets rid of ions in water, but it does not get rid of microorganisms, including the NTM in water. 
So slowly but surely, the patients have helped me learn what to do. And so this opportunity is marvelous. And uh, what do we have now? We have 143 questions. That's fine. That, oh, now we just lost one. Oh, because um, there, there's some thank yous. So I'm making sure I thank them back for okay. attending. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Amy, you're doing a marvelous job. You know, I just I want to say, Joe, as much as you're benefiting from patients, the patients are benefiting from your research. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> the second question that I think needs to be answered before we go, is it safe to drink bottled beer or tap beer or should they just avoid beer? Oh, well, I mean, yes. that's a really difficult one. No, I wouldn't worry about fermented beverages. They do a lot of stuff. And particularly the, uh, the big brewers filter their, their brew, their, their uh, what would I call it? Their fermentation product pretty well. Well, everybody, thank you very much for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> we really appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Maris, for joining us and for that wonderful presentation.